All right. So before we begin, we just ask that everyone mute themselves. And if you have any questions, you can either um, unmute yourself and ask, or you can write your questions in the chat and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, the presentation will also be recorded and posted to our YouTube page. Um, so you will be able to access it at a later time if needed. So today we're gonna to be talking about the importance of the flu vaccine during COVID-19 and what you should know. So these are some of our student leaders who are here today, as well as some of our faculty and staff leaders who help um, bring all this programming to you and, and make, you know, help a program. And then here are the presenters who are gonna to present today. I'm gonna to pass it over to them. Uh, right, I am first, so I'll start. My name is Ms. Gallier. Um, I am a first year student at the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies at Queens College. Um, and my professional background is in journalism and health literacy and health journalism. Hi everyone, my name is Gwyneth. Um, I'm a junior here studying health science. I'm currently interning with the New York State Department of Health and doing research in the emergency department of Stony Brook Hospital. Hi, my name is Christine Weber. I'm a first year graduate student at the School of Social Welfare at Stony Brook. My interests include support services for the elderly and helping those with cognitive disabilities. Hi everyone, my name is Philip Massaro. I'm a senior at the Stony Brook School of Nursing and I'm looking forward to this presentation today. I'm also certified as a health education specialist, CPR instructor, a firefighter and critical care EMT. Hi everybody, my name is Winnie De Los Santos. I'm a senior at the School of Social Welfare at Stony Brook University. All right, and then these are the learning objectives for today's webinar. So by the end of this webinar, participants will be able to identify the two main types of influenza virus strains, identify when people who have the flu are most contagious, identify who is at high risk of complications from the flu, identify how many doses of the flu vaccine is re recommended each year, identify the percentage of the, per the percentage the flu vaccine reduces the risk of flu illness, identify how long it takes your body to produce antibodies from the flu, and identify this, the symptoms of the flu and COVID that overlap. Now I'm gonna pass it along to our student presenters. All right, hi everyone. I'm gonna get started with what is the flu? So influenza or flu is a contagious respiratory illness caused by influenza viruses. It can cause mild to severe illness. Serious outcomes of the flu infection and result in hospitalization or death. There are two main types of influenza or flu virus, types A and B. In the influenza A and B viruses that routinely spread in people, which are the human influenza viruses, are responsible for um, seasonal flu epidemics each year. And the best way to prevent flu is by getting vaccinated each year. So how does the flu spread? Many experts believe that flu viruses spread mainly by tiny droplets, made when people um, with flu cough, sneeze, or talk. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby. And less often, a person might get flu by touching a surface or an object that has flu virus on it and then touching their own nose or mouth, um, maybe even their eyes. Um, you may be able to spread flu to someone else before you know you're sick, um, as well as while you're sick. People with flu are contagious in the first three to four days after their illness begins. So the CDC estimates that over the past decade, each year the flu has been responsible for up to 45 million illnesses, 810,000 hospitalizations and 61,000 deaths. These numbers vary each year based on when the flu season starts, the effectiveness of the vaccine and the number of people who get vaccinated. The CDC recommends getting vaccinated in the early fall before the season starts, which gives um, antibodies in the vaccine time to work. So when the flu season gets going, you have a chance to fight it. 
So here um, is a visual of cases in Suffolk County over the past four years. Um, and as you can tell, 2018, sorry, 2017, 2018 season um, was noticeably more severe than comparable seasons. And this is the same visual except for Nassau County and the same correlation 2017 to, to 2018, um, there was a spike in cases. So explaining the 2017, 2018 flu season, why did the 2017, 2018 flu season have more cases? In 2017, 2018, the dominant strain was H3N2, which is known to cause more serious illnesses and tends to be less responsive to vaccination than other strains. Some years, the strains of the flu vaccine are different than flu strains that are circulating that flu season due to the flu virus undergoing frequent genetic changes. So regardless of the, uh, regardless of the strain, those who get a flu shot will likely fare better than those who go unprotected. So when is influenza season? According to the CDC, seasonal influenza viruses are detected each year, um, sorry, detected year round in the United States. However, it is most common during the fall and winter months. Exact timing and duration of flu season varies from year to year. Typically flu increases in October and peaks in December to February. However, it can last as late as May. Uh, peak month is the month with the highest percentage of respiratory specimens testing positive flu for flu during the season. Um, the CDC collects, compiles, and analyzes information on flu activity year round and produces the flu view, which is a weekly surveillance report. So who is at greater risk? Flu vaccination is especially important for people who are at high risk from flu, many of whom are also at high risk for COVID or other serious outcomes. Specific high-risk groups include adults 65 or older, pregnant women, young children, especially children with neurological conditions, patients with asthma, heart disease and stroke, diabetes, HIV AIDS, cancer, and chronic kidney disease. Okay, great. So now I'm gonna pass it over to the next student speaker. Thank you. Uh, okay, that's me. Uh, so the single best way to prevent seasonal flu is to get vaccinated each year. Other good health habits can help stop the spread of germs and prevent respiratory illnesses like flu. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. When you're sick, keep your distance from others to protect them from getting sick too. If possible, stay home from work, school, and errands when you are sick. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue when coughing or sneezing, and avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. Flu and other serious respiratory illnesses, like respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, whooping cough, and COVID-19, are spread by coughing, sneezing, or unclean hands. Um, washing your hands often will help protect you from germs. If soap and water are not available, use an alcohol-based hand rub. Clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces. Hmm. Great, so the importance of prevention methods. It's imperative to take preventive methods such as hand washing, social distancing, flu vaccine, and face masks due to these reasons. These preventive measures set up for COVID-19 prevention can help slow the transmission of the flu as well. By getting vaccinated for the flu, it will ease the burden of the hospital system, allowing them to focus on patients with COVID-19. It will also help to conserve scarce medical resources. Um, the flu vaccine can help decrease severe flu infections for high-risk patients. Uh, the flu vaccine reduces the risk of going to the doctor with the flu by 40 to 60%. And then we have a little uh, flu prevention tips infographic um, that includes like exercise, staying home until your fever is gone, um, keeping your hands clean, covering your mouth and nose, and uh, definitely getting vaccinated because your flu risk is reduced 60% by vaccine. So let's go to the next slide. Um, 
What is a vaccine? Vaccines contain the same germs that cause disease. For example, measles vaccine contains measles virus and hip vaccine contains hip bacteria. But they've been either killed or weakened to the point that they don't make you sick. Some vaccines contain only a part of the disease germ. A vaccine stimulates your immune system to produce antibodies, exactly like it would if you were exposed to the disease. After getting vaccinated, you develop immunity to that disease without having to get the disease first. This is what makes vaccines such powerful medicine. Unlike most medicines which treat or cure diseases, vaccines prevent them. Next slide. Right, uh, so how are flu vaccines made? There are only three influenza vaccines that received approval from the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Um, Egg-based production is most common. Um, and it's been used for more than 70 years. It's used to make both inactivated or killed vaccines and live attenuated or weakened vaccines. Candidate vaccine viruses or CVVs are selected based on what research indicates will be most common during the upcoming season. CVVs are then injected into fertilized hen's eggs that are incubated for several days to allow viruses to replicate. Uh, the second way is cell-based production. Um, vaccines are isolated and grown or replicated in cultured cells of mammals rather than in hen's eggs. Uh, and the third is recombinant flu production. This is the only vaccine that is 100% egg-free that's on the U.S. market. Uh, it involves the joining of DNA molecules from two different species that are inserted into a host organism to produce a new genetic combination. It also takes the least amount of time to produce since it doesn't rely on egg supply. Okay. So, how many strains of the flu are there? There are three types of flu viruses that can affect humans, uh, A, B, and C. The fourth type, D viruses, primarily affect cattle and are not known to infect or cause illnesses in people. Type A and B cause the season flu epidemics. Type C, which an annual vaccine does not present, protect against, also causes the flu, but the symptoms tend to be much less severe. So type A, wild birds commonly act as hosts for this flu virus, also known as avian or bird flu, uh, which does not normally infect humans. However, human influenza A viruses are common and constantly changing. Current subtypes of influenza A viruses found in people are influenza A H1N1 and influenza A H3N2 viruses, according to the CDC. Uh, type B. Unlike type A, type B is only found in humans. These viruses are not classified by subtype and do not cause pandemics. Uh, they generally cause less severe reactions. Uh, and then type C. These viruses are also only found in people. They tend to be milder than type A and B, and people generally do not become very ill from type C flu viruses. Next slide. Uh, when should you get the flu vaccine? Um, you should get the flu vaccine before the virus begins to spread in your community, since it takes about two weeks after the vaccination for antibodies to develop in the body and provide protection against the flu. The CDC recommends people get a flu vaccine in September or October. Um, anything earlier is likely to be associated with reduced protection against the flu later in the flu season, particularly among older adults. Though I imagine it is not too late to get your vaccine now if you haven't gotten it already. It's only November 3rd. Um, children six months to eight years old who require two doses should receive their first dose as soon as possible after a vaccine becomes available because the two doses must be given at least four weeks apart. Next slide, please. Uh, number of recommended doses. Um, two doses. 
for a child younger than nine years old who is getting the vaccine for the first time or who has had only one dose of the vaccine in total prior to July 1st, 2020. One dose if your child previously got two doses of flu vaccine at any time, and one dose for those ages nine or older, even if your child gets the flu vaccine for the first time at age nine. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Should you get vaccinated multiple times throughout the season? No, only one dose of flu vaccine is recommended each season. Um, and now I will pass it on to Christine. Yes, hi. So how well does the flu vaccine work? The CDC conducts studies each year to determine how well the flu vaccine protects against flu illness. While vaccine effectiveness can vary, Recent studies show that flu vaccination reduces the risk of flu illness by between 40 and 60% among the overall population. At least two factors play an important role in determining the likelihood that the flu vaccine will protect a person from flu illness. One, characteristics of a person being vaccinated, such as their age and their health. Two, the similarity or match between the flu viruses the flu vaccine is designed to protect against and the flu viruses spreading in the community. While determining how well the flu vaccine works is challenging, recent studies have supported the conclusion that the flu vaccination greatly benefits public health, especially when the flu vaccine is well matched to circulating flu viruses. So this slide shows where you can receive the flu vaccine. Major pharmacy chains such as CVS, Walgreens, Stop and Shop, as well as healthcare clinics and healthcare provider offices. We have posted and provided some informative websites to find a location nearest you, such as the CDC, the Stony Brook Medicine, and the Nassau County and Suffolk County websites. So how is the flu vaccine distributed? The flu vaccine is produced and distributed by private sector companies. The Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC do not have the authority to control influenza vaccine distribution, nor the resources to manage such effort. However, the department has made significant efforts to enhance production capacity of several influenza vaccines, including supporting manufacturers as they invest in the processes to stabilize and increase their production capacity. Manufacturers have distributed 66.6 .6 million doses of the flu vaccine as of September 11th, 2020. So how is the flu vaccine administered? The flu vaccine is administered in the following ways, by injection, the nasal spray, or the jet injector. The injection is the most common method. Possible undesirable effects include swelling, redness, and soreness. The nasal spray includes a dose of attenuated flu virus or weakens, not killed. Therefore, it is not recommended for children under two, adults 50 and older, pregnant women, people who are immunocompromised, and certain medical conditions. However, the spray is an alternative option for those who have a fear of needles. The jet injector is a medical device that uses a high pressure stream of fluid to get into the skin rather than a needle is another alternative method. However, it's only recommended for those aged 18 to 64. So who should not get vaccinated? Children younger than six months of age, people with severe life-threatening allergies to the flu vaccine or any ingredient in the vaccine. You should definitely contact your healthcare provider before you have the vaccine if you have an allergy to egg or to any of the ingredients in the vaccine. If you ever have had a uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or if you're not feeling well, talk to your doctor about your symptoms. Another, another thing that people question is, can you still get the flu even after you've been vaccinated? And what does this really mean? Well, the exposure to the flu virus shortly after you've been vaccinated, your body needs two weeks to form antibodies from the flu virus. 
Another possible way is exposure to the flu virus strain that was not included in the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine contains only three to four viral strains predicted to be the most common for that particular season. And finally, the flu vaccine's effectiveness can vary, as mentioned earlier, depending on the age and health of the person receiving the vaccine. Older people and people with certain chronic illnesses may develop less immunity after the vaccination. So this slide shows uh, different ways for diagnostic testing for the flu. So rapid influenza diagnostic tests, or RIDTs, takes about approximately 10 to 15 minutes, and it measures part of the virus, the antigens, that stimulate an immune response. Another way is with the rapid macular assays, it takes approximately 15 to 20 minutes, and it detects genetic material of the virus. It's a higher level of accuracy than the RIDTs. And now I'm going to hand it off to Philip. All right, thank you, Christine. All right, so we're gonna talk about the treatment for the flu. All right, so how can we get better from the flu and what options are out there for treatment? Most people who get sick from the flu only have a mild illness and therefore do not require medical care or antiviral drugs. However, the CDC recommends that if a person has symptoms, they should remain home and avoid contact with people except to get medical care. If a person is in a high-risk group or is very sick, he or she should contact their healthcare provider. High-risk groups include young children, people over 65 years old, pregnant women, and people with underlying medical conditions. A high-risk person with flu symptoms should contact his or her healthcare provider immediately to receive antiviral treatment as early as possible. The CDC recommends that treatment within two days after illness onset or when your illness begins for the greatest possible benefit. A person with the flu should stay home for at least 24 hours after the fever has subsided. He or she should only leave the home for medical care and other necessities. The fever should go away without the use of fever-reducing medicine, such as Tylenol. The CDC recommends against the use of medicines like aspirin or Pepto-Bismol for anyone 18 years and younger. The use of these kinds of medicines can cause a very rare and serious complication called Reyes syndrome. A person should avoid contact with others while they are ill. When going out, he or she should wear a face mask, cover coughs and sneeze with a tissue, and wash hands often to avoid spreading the flu to other people. So over-the-counter medications as treatment. So in a typical case of influenza, only rest and plenty of fluids is necessary for recovery. Otherwise, in a case of severe infection or high risk of complications, your primary care provider may prescribe antiviral drugs, which are available only with a prescription. Over-the-counter medications such as acetaminophen or Tylenol or ibuprofen or Motrin can be taken to deal with the achiness that comes along with the flu. However, children and teenagers 18 years and older should never take aspirin because they are susceptible to contracting Reyes syndrome, which is a rare syndrome that causes confusion, swelling on the brain, and even liver damage. So a few on this chart, we can see some antiviral medications for flu treatment. Some of you may have heard the uh, name Tamiflu. This medication is an antiviral medication and it comes in a pill or liquid form with a prescription from a provider. And you take it two times a day for about five days. However, some common side effects are nausea and vomiting. We also have Relenza, which is an inhaled powder. Again, two times a day for five days. And it can cause bronchospasms or some tightness in the chest and some mild difficulty breathing. We also have Rapavav, which is an intravenous drip. Again, this medication would not be something that you would be taking outside the hospital. This is something that you would be admitted in the hospital and receiving treatment for this dose. And we also have Zofluza, which is a pill and it's a single dose antiviral medication. Again, all these prescribed by a healthcare provider and always consult your healthcare provider with any questions for treatment regarding the flu. So preventing flu illnesses. During the 2018 and 2019 flu season, about 49% of the US population got a flu vaccine. 
people getting vaccinated helped prevent 4.4 million flu-related illnesses, 58,000 flu hospitalizations, and 3,500 flu deaths. You can help by getting your flu vaccine and encouraging your family and friends to get theirs also. The more people get a flu vaccine, the fewer people who get sick. So we're going to discuss flu vaccination trends around the world. So some trends or the way certain numbers have been looking over the years. So there is no global monitoring system for flu vaccine coverage, but many drug companies that make flu vaccines provide data about vaccination distribution in over 201 countries. A survey of data from years 2004 to 2015 then that only 5% of flu vaccine doses were distributed to 50% of the world's population. This means that globally, not enough people are getting vaccinated. So some recommendations for vaccination. The World Health Organization, or WHO, reports a decline in flu vaccination worldwide, particularly in high-risk groups, such as the following. As we discussed before, people age 65 and older, children ages six months to five years, healthcare workers, women who are pregnant, people with serious medical conditions. The World Health Organization, or WHO, recommends people in these groups to get annual flu vaccines. In other countries, like the US, we recommend that everyone aged six months and older get a flu vaccination. A few vaccine projections for the 2020-2021 season. So what is it going to look like? The Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotions Healthy People targets to get at least one dose of seasonal flu vaccine to 70% of everyone six months or older, 80% of people who are pregnant, and 90% of healthcare workers. These are some great goals that we can hopefully achieve in the upcoming season. For the 2020-2021 season, the companies that make flu vaccines have stated that they will provide up to 198 million doses of the seasonal flu vaccine. As of the week of September 11, 2020, 66.6 .6 million doses of flu vaccine had been administered to people in the U.S. All right, so now I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Winnie, who will talk about the flu and COVID-19. Thank you, Philip. So influenza, flu, and COVID-19 are both contagious respiratory illnesses, but they are caused by different viruses. Since some of the symptoms of the flu and COVID-19 are similar, it may be hard to tell the difference between them based on symptoms alone, and testing may be needed to help confirm a diagnosis. Flu and COVID-19 share many characteristics, but there are some key differences between the two. Both COVID-19 and the flu can have varying degrees of signs and symptoms, ranging from no symptoms, asymptomatic, to severe symptoms. Common symptoms that COVID-19 and the flu share include fever or chill, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, tiredness, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose, muscle pain or body aches, and headaches. Other signs and symptoms of COVID-19 different from the flu may include a change in loss or taste and smell. I'm gonna hand it over to um, Janine Logan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I just, I'm with the Long Island Health Collaborative and with the Nassau Suffolk Hospital Council. And just wanted to remind everyone, and you guys have done a great job of presenting about the flu and COVID, that one of the main reasons that we want to ensure that everyone who's eligible and who is healthy enough to get a flu vaccination, one of the main reasons we want that to happen is so that we can avoid a surge in hospital capacity and overwhelming hospitals as you know, COVID is beginning to creep back into our area. And the worst thing we need is to have this twindemic occur and flood our hospitals and overwhelm our health providers. So we're getting the word out on behalf of uh, all of the hospitals on Long Island and in the uh, Northern Metropolitan region in the Hudson Valley. 
And on behalf of those local county health departments here on Long Island and in the Hudson Valley, to get your flu vaccination, contact your local hospital, your health department, certainly contact your primary health care provider, even at a CVS or one of the other main pharmaceutical companies uh, to get a vaccination. Uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, certainly you want to protect yourself. You don't want to come down with the flu. You don't want to come down with the flu and COVID at the same time because we do not know no, that has, ha hasn't happened, at least not in this area. And we really don't know what the outcome would be or how we would even handle that. So I just wanted to remind everyone that on our website, we have one-stop shopping where you can find out information about the flu at the Cheney's Flu Vaccine Campaign page, which is, I believe, listed there. And um, you can find out additional information from trusted resources about flu and flu vaccination. Thank you. So the flu and you. A couple of libraries are going to ha be having flu shot clinics um, Thursday, November 12th at the Riverhead Public Library and Saturday, November 14th at the Patchogue Medford Public Library. It's gonna be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Ages have to be 18 and over. Nobody will be turned away due to insurance or inability to pay. It is run by Sun River Healthcare State-of-the-Art Mobile Clinic and an appointment is required. So please call 845-754-6507. These are some national helpline resources, um, such as the Disaster Distress Hotline, National Suicide Prevention Hotline, or the Lifeline Crisis Chat for Spanish, um, National Vi Domestic Violence Hotline, National Child Abuse Hotline, National Sexual Assault Hotline, Suicide Prevention Hotline, the Elder Care Locator, Veteran Crisis Hotline, um, and you can also find a healthcare provider for treat or treatment for substance use disorder and mental health um, with the um, SAMHSA National Helpline, the Suffolk County Crisis Response or DASH, um, the CPEP program at Stony Brook, Crisis Residence at Pilgrim State. Um, there's also a domestic violence and sexual assault 24 hour hotline. Additionally, the response hotline, you can also check the website for that. Um, the Long Island Center for Addiction Substance Abuse Hotline, the Talbot House, which is a 24 hour substance abuse crisis, um, Adult Protective Services, CPS, um, Long Island Crisis Center, the Suffolk County Department of Social Services Emergency Services Hotline, and Sagamore Children's Crisis Respite House and Suffolk Crisis Respite Vet Network. Additionally, you can contact um, the HELP program with their Facebook, their website, their email and phone number. And there's also gonna be videos posted on YouTube as well. And now we'll open um, the presentation to see if anyone has any questions. Any questions? All right, so I guess that um, ends our presentation. Um, it will, the recording and the PDF of the slide deck will be posted to our Facebook and YouTube sites probably in the next day or so. So if there's any information that maybe you wanna watch again or you need the numbers, the phone numbers, or or the links, you can find those on our web pages. Thank you.